All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the third session of our study group on the autobiography of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Again, my name is Jessica Colligan, and with me, of course, is Father Jerry Blaschek, who will be leading our discussion this evening. We, as always, ask that you please keep your microphones muted while Father Jerry is speaking, but we do encourage you to use either the chat or the raise hand feature if you want to either answer some of the questions that Father Jerry is posing to the group or if you have questions of your own that you would like to get his thoughts on. We have really enjoyed the interactions that we've had with you over the last two sessions and look forward to hearing from you again tonight. And now I'll pass things over to Father Jerry. Thank you very much, Jessica. Uh, again, I see some familiar names and some new names. Uh, you're all most welcome. I hope that you and your families and communities enjoyed a, uh, a rich and beautiful uh, Easter uh, celebration of Paschal Triduum. And uh, I hope that you continue to enjoy Easter, both in the Latin rite and in the Greek rite. Uh, the week of Easter is a continuation. Easter doesn't last one day. It lasts not even only seven or eight days. It lasts 50 days, so the celebration of Easter goes on and on uh, in our liturgical year. So again, thank you for being here, and let me uh, reiterate Jessica's invitation for you to, uh, to intervene at any time with questions or comments or corrections. Uh, this is supposed to be ideally a book study club, and so the more participation, the better. Uh, we're at the stage in Ignatius's memoirs, autobiography, reminiscences, in which Ignatius covers the time between his return from the Holy Land, that, well, let's be honest, kind of an aborted effort uh, to spend his life in the Holy Land, uh, with through the courtesy of our Franciscan friends, uh, they wisely uh, anticipated that Ignatius would probably get himself in trouble, and they'd have to get him out of it, so they sent him back. And when, when Ignatius arrives in Barcelona, he, uh, he decides that he's going to do something that I don't think he would have anticipated. What does Ignatius decide to do when he gets back to Barcelona, when he gets to yeah. Barcelona? Okay. Anybody? What's going on here? I can't, I can't hear. Hi, Mary, Mary Francis. What does he decide oh, yeah. to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does he decide to go back and spend more time in solitude uh, at Manresa or what, what, to join the monks it? at uh, Montserrat? Uh, those two. I'm not happy here. So this would be, you know. Well, let's just go back. Yeah, it's, it's uh, the uh, sixth uh, part of the autobiography right, from right. Barcelona. We're... Not sure how, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how he draws the conclusion at this stage he, you know, it, it wasn't even terribly clear what he intended to do in the Holy Land. He, he wanted to stay. But you remember that from the very beginning of the process of his conversion yeah, okay. at Castle Loyola, he starts, to notice, he starts to notice that, right that here. His, his conversations, his conversations about the things of God uh, seem to move people, right? And even in Manresa, you remember, he noticed uh, he was already giving the spiritual, in some form or another, he was already giving the essentials of the spiritual exercises. And many people were coming to him for what he would call spiritual conversation. I'm not sure how he drew the conclusion, but by the time he gets back to Barcelona, he decides that he has to study that he has to study. He acknowledges that he doesn't know the first thing about theology, that he had been a rather sketchy Catholic uh, and uh, didn't have a lot of the foundational elements of an, even of an understanding of our faith, much less of its practice. So what does, he, what does he begin to do? He goes to school and then Ignatius has an episode where I say Ignatius begins to uh, refine his technique of uh, of discernment of spirits. So he decides that for the good of souls, for the good of his helping souls, he's going to study. Now remember, Ignatius is a lay person. Ignatius doesn't have the beginnings of a college degree, much less uh, the theological preparation for ordination. And there's no indication at this point that Ignatius uh, sees himself as founding a religious order or even being a priest. But he knows that somehow greater study uh, deeper study is going to help him help souls. 
So he begins and he, he doesn't know any Latin. He can't get any higher studies at all until he gets his Latin down. So many times in uh, lithographs and pictures of Ignatius or sketches of Ignatius, you have Ignatius in his 30s at this stage, sitting on, on a school bench with kids in there, and, you know, who were uh, learning the rudiments of Latin. So Ignatius is studying. I don't know whether any of you had to study Latin or Greek, but you remember how tedious learning the conjugations and the declensions are. But Ignatius is doing it. He's learning his conjugations and declensions. And what happens? He has a bit of a crisis. Denise, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Is that when he got arrested? No, no, no. That all comes soon enough. But I'll weigh that's, in. A good, that's a good guess because whenever he's in school, he gets arrested. Tess, what, what happens when he's studying? He has mystical visions and he's distracted by these spiritual encounters and uh, then discerns later that they were uh, false consolations. What is, a, what is a false consolation, Tess? Well, he discerns later that they were probably distractions sent by the enemy of human nature. Excellent, excellent. So Ignatius begins to, initially, I mean, wouldn't it seem simply common sense in the best spiritual sense? If I'm receiving uh, 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 profound spiritual experiences of, of a mystical nature, uh, this must be from God, right? It must be from God. But then, Tess, what, what, what kind of rules of the, spirit, of, of the discernment of spirits does he begin to employ? That make him question that. Um, I'm going to venture a guess here that it was a distraction to his studies, and it wasn't these these visions weren't allowing him to remember anything that he was reading or studying. So it's, it was taking him away from his goal of helping souls. There you go. There you go. If there's a kind of, you know, Tess, you probably heard me say that there's a kind of a ruthlessness almost about Ignatian logic. If what he's doing is to help souls, then the means to attain that goal is, 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 is to be of, of service to God. It's to be of service to God. And so the primary goal must always be to adhere, to align oneself to the service of God, which for Ignatius is going to flow always in the service of souls, the care of souls. And so Ignatius begins to realize that uh, nothing, nothing should get in the way uh, of doing that. And then Ignatius manifests, I think, a, a very, very courageous and instructive um, insight. Ignatius goes to the schoolmaster and he lays it all out to him uh, and says, look, I got to tell you that this is what's going on. And uh, uh, I've been distracted. I haven't been doing my grammar because I've been all caught up in what I thought were religious experiences. Uh, and so Ignatius lays out for uh, his schoolmaster the truth. This is the kind of experience that convinces Ignatius of the value of transparency. And it sounds kind of commonsensical, but uh, we know how hard that is. We know that people really uh, can get so lost uh, if they don't have a relationship in which they commit themselves to simply telling the truth, simply unguardedly sharing what is happening in their lives. That's what Ignatius does. Um, he'll eventually kind of he'll, he'll eventually put this in uh, in good language when Ignatius says in his spiritual exercises among his, his rules for discerning spirits. Um, Ignatius says the enemy of our human nature turns his wiles and persuasions upon an upright person. He intends and desires them to be received and kept in secret. But when the person reveals them to a confessor or to some other good person, then the person begins to understand the enemy's deceits and malice. He is grievously disappointed, for the enemy sees that he cannot succeed in his malicious project, which he has begun, because his manifest deceptions have been detected. 
And that's a lot of what Ignatian spiritual practice will be about, as those of you who have been involved know, that uh, when Ignatius will invite people to come, <laughs> if you come to the Ignatian Center for, Spirit, the Center for Ignatian Spirituality, uh, what's going to be required is an openness of heart and a transparency, not because uh, the, the people who are directors or voyeurs or get some sort of an emotional satisfaction out of, of you know, intruding in your private life, but there has to be a place where in candor and in trust, one tells the truth. And until you find a place where you can unguardedly tell the truth, the opportunities for the enemy to deceive us uh, are legion. Uh, and so Ignatius is establishing already by telling the story of Barcelona, he's helping the early Jesuits and people involved with the wider Ignatian community to understand this principle that Ignatius himself had to learn that it was vital simply to reveal the truth of his situation. Ignatius then goes on to say, uh, describing himself, um, that he made this promise uh, to put aside his spiritual, his, his enlightenments and his journeys um, with great earnestness. And he never again had that temptation. Again, there's a kind of a, once Ignatius sees what needs to be done, there's an exigency about him. There's a clarity about him. Once he's seen that this temptation can catch him, he reveals it, he tells people about it, and then he decides uh, that he's not gonna go ahead with it. Any other comments or questions about Ignatius in Barcelona? So Ignatius, again, no shilly-shallying. Once he understands what's at stake, he's gonna make a decision and he's gonna be explicit about it and share it with people. Okay, Ignatius goes to Alcala. What happens in Alcala? Alcala was the great city of the university, or was a great university city. Uh, Ignatius leaves Barcelona, and uh, the next stage in his journey is to go to Alcala, and there emerges a, a pattern of his life that I want to suggest is almost paradigmatic of what Ignatian people do at least in the Ignatian tradition. What happens when Ignatius gets to Alcala? He does study, right? But what else does he do? He does study, but what else happens to Ignatius in Alcala, which might be revelatory or illustrative of a paradigm that emerges in Ignatius's earliest years that then are replicated structurally wherever Jesuits and Ignatian folks do anything. Remember, remember what I said that Ignatius tells his story because it represents not just his story, but his life and his primitive experience in his early, uh, um, his, his first experience becomes, again, a manifestation of what it seems uh, Jesuits, Ignatian communities keep doing. So what happens? Always studying. <laughs> Always studying. Ignatius keeps studying. He keeps wanting to know better and more. And remember, Ignatius is still a lay person. But what does he do in Alcala? Not only does he study, but what else does he do? Anybody remember? I think I Denise. remember. <laughs> Please. We'll see. we'll see how I do this time. <laughs> Didn't he start um, gathering with people and starting yes. to talk to them and, and do some kind of early form of spiritual exercises with them? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Now, mind you, he's a lay person. But he's starting to gather people who have religious hunger, who have religious interests. And he starts giving us some form of the spiritual exercises. And he also starts explaining Christian doctrine. Now, mind you, uh, not unlike our own time, uh, you know, people are hungry spiritually and people are saying, you know, I mean, even our students will sometimes say to me, Father, we need, we need, you know, Catholicism 101, you know, uh, we, we don't have the faintest idea what Catholicism is really about. And what they mean by that is I don't really have any idea what the Christian message is all about. Uh, you know, and, and these are many of our students who would have come from, uh, you know, traditional families uh, who would still identify as Catholic, but we're at a time in Ignatius's time and, and differently, but still there's a certain connection. People are looking for some explanation uh, of Christian doctrine. 
And li listen to what Ignatius observes um, from his giving the spiritual exercises and from explaining Christian doctrine. He said, this brought forth great fruit for the glory of God. He couldn't help but notice that the experience of people entering to the spiritual exercises in one form or another, and to their having Christian doctrine explained to them in a way that was coherent and practical and relevant, brought forth great fruit. And then he uses language that is so, um, so core to our tradition. Many came to a deep knowledge and relish of spiritual things. A deep knowledge, not a superficial adherence, not a legalistic uh, abiding with, but many came to a deep knowledge and a relish. Uh, and again, Ignatius in the Spanish uses that sense of saborear. Uh, they, they, they tasted and delighted uh, in what they began to experience. Ignatius said also that many who came to him for doctrine or for spiritual exercises were undergoing various trials. And then he said, a great number of people gathered whenever he explained doctrine. Interestingly, it's not a bad description of what happened when the early Jesuits got started, right? People came because they needed in the preaching, in the teaching, and in the spiritual exercises, to have doctrine, fundamental Christian uh, doctrine explained to them, and in such a way that the understanding was deep. Now, there's another element to what they did. So, they st so Ignatius studies, he gives the exercises, he teaches doctrine, though he admits he has almost no foundation himself. What else does he do? What else does he do? He does something that I'm very proud to say I do a great deal of. I, yes, I do give the spiritual exercises and I do teach Christian doctrine, uh, but there's one other element that I spend a lot of time doing, and I like to imagine myself imitating St. Ignatius in this as well. Fundraising. <laughs> Ignatius was going around and asking people for money, you know, not only for, not just begging for himself, but he was, he would ask people to help him help the poor. So there's a kind of a coherence always in the Ignatian approach. He said Ignatius went out to assist the poor and he didn't have the resources himself. So he would go and ask people who hmm. were coming to him for spiritual direction or for doctrine. And he would say, we have to help the poor. Yeah, Jerry, go ahead, Don, please. Well, the thing, thing that impressed me about Ignatius like, is the fact that he, um, he he handled situations with great openness and flexibility, and he he was really highly motivated and for a higher learning too. Because when the challenge was, people were saying to look, you don't belong to a religious order, you, you're not a priest, you're not, you know, what authority do you have this, to be the inquis inquisitors were saying that to him, and even they got upset when they said, well, you can go ahead and teach because everything seems all right. You know, I guess it was kosher. You know, everything was okay. But but the thing was, you're not allowed to talk about the difference between venial and mortal sins. Right. Until, until you get some further schooling. And, and that's amazing. You know, he, but he, he was really very flexible. And he, he was discerning where God was. And he said in his life, and he talks about making Jesus the master. And then we learned, later learned that the master was reserved that title for people that got their master's degrees or right. advanced degrees. But to me, that's the other thing was when he, he did beg, he was such a generous dude. Like, you know, <laughs> he, he was, he gave the money away. Absolutely. He, 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 Absolutely. And that was really almost Christ-like, too. So he was I mean, so, so I would say the, the fundamental paradigm uh, of the kind of approach that our spirituality brings is, if you notice, Ignatius, of course, he was going to the liturgy, um, but he's a lay person. And so Ignatian spirituality is, is from its foundation, a lay spirituality. Mm -hmm. huh? yeah. That it's about, it's about a personal experience of God. Of course, you're affiliated with the church, but it doesn't require ordination, doesn't require religious vows. This will be the form that Ignatius and his companions will eventually take. But already the primary forms of Ignatian ministry 
explaining doctrine in a way that makes sense to people and transforms their lives, the spiritual exercises, yeah, organizing it, people. Yeah. Ignatius wasn't doing this all himself. He was organizing people to care for the poor. Yeah, but he uh, was, Jerry, just one thing I sure, thought come true for me, and I'll be quiet, because no, no, I want my you to sisters be quiet. and brothers. The idea was he was developing the exercises by living it. Precisely. Precisely. That's, what, that's, what's so, that's why it's so powerful, because he, he, he comes across these uh, forks and road all the time, and he's discerning, what should I do? What are these thoughts I have? They seem good initially, but... I get, but what's the exercise say? What is the outcome? What is the fruit of? That's right. I don't develop students. I don't so there you go back students. to Barcelona, Don. You know, it seemed like a great idea to, to, you know, to stay with these mystical inspirations and this beautiful prayer. But he's saying at the end of the day, I'm here. I'm supposed to be studying, because yeah. that's what's going to help souls. So there's a there's a kind of an Ignatian on calm logic and pragmatism. Okay, so Ignatius goes to Alcala to the university. He's doing all this stuff, and then. Ignatius in the autobiography introduces a topic which we see throughout the rest of the autobiography. Who starts sniffing around? Immediately, Ignatius is doing all this stuff, and immediately, even in Alcala, he finds out that there are rumors and differences of opinion about him, and suspicion and hostility. And guess who's coming after him? The Inquisition. The Inquisition. The Inquisition. Yeah. What's going on here? Why? Two things. Why is the Inquisition after Ignatius? And secondly, why, 20, 30 years later, is Ignatius still telling this story? Why is Ignatius still telling the story of how he was dogged by the Inquisition in Alcala, in Salamanca, in Paris? And by the way, when he, when he gets to Rome, it's no better. Why does he keep remembering this? And what is it about the way he dealt with it that you think is in some way a legacy for his computer for his community then, and maybe even for his community now? I don't know if it happened in the beginning, but I know there were at least a few times that when he knew he was that there were rumors about him and that he knew he was going to be questioned, that he took matters into his own hand and approached them and said, why do you want to talk to me? This is, you know, this is what I'm about. Let, there you go. And, and would give them all the information. There you go. So in a certain way, Ignatius is doing two things right off the bat. He's, he's not saying to hell with the Inquisition. You have no right to be, you know, there, they, this should not exist. The church has no right to interfere with me. On the other hand, and he, and he, he will say that he will follow the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the injunctions that are given to him or the sentences that are laid out for him. He will follow them according to the territory, when, when he's in the territory where those rules apply. When it, when it doesn't, he won't. Uh, but he wants protocol to be followed. Right. He's saying, if you have a problem with me, spell it out. You want more information? I'll give it to you. Now, you know, who knows how he, act, he he seems like he was I mean, he was respectful, but he certainly wasn't fawning on authority, was he? I mean, he, has, he doesn't present himself as fawning with authority. He's saying, you have a problem. Tell me what it is. You, 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 you tell me that you have no problems with me. All right. So then I want I want an official statement of my innocence. So, I mean, he accepts that the church has structures that to which he chooses out of a sense of communio and loyalty to be uh, to be respectful and accountable to, but he's not servile. He's not, you know, uh, uh, he's not saying, oh, whatever you say. No, he's saying, let's get this, let's do this right, right? And let's do this according to, to right jurisdiction and to rules, and uh, and I will abide by it, but that's it. So there, there's an interesting model because the society over the course of history uh, has, this was not the last time we'd have difficulty with church authority. Go ahead, Denise. I kind of love, love that he brought his own notary with him. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just be sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Don. Or Kevin, Kevin, is that? Go ahead, yeah, that, um, I was just going to say, it seems that he kind of, he believes that he's doing right and he trusts that the good is going to set him free in these conversations, right? He goes That's into right. it fully 
uh, explaining himself and accepting the consequences. But if you really believe in the end in mind, that that's that's kind of the right approach, I would guess. You know, to the point, exactly, to the point where, you know, later on in Alcala, you know, he's been in and out of jail and, you know, he's in jail. They, they put him in jail again. And uh, people are saying, well, Ignatius has a lot of connections, right? And so why doesn't he use his connections to get out of jail? And you remember, was it in Salamanca? There's, in fact, a jailbreak, and the doors are open, and Ignatius refuses to leave. And at one stage, he says, he for whose love I have come here will set me free if his will is served thereby. I find that, you know, extremely a revelatory of who Ignatius is. He for whose love I have come here will set me free if his will is served thereby. Which is to say there's nothing more important in Ignatius's life than the love which has motivated him to do what he's doing and that he be, that, that everything that he do serve the will of God. And that that's finally, if, if the will of God is that Ignatius is going to stay in jail and suffer, Ignatius is going to say, all right, I, I may fight it legally, I may insist on following protocol, but at the end of the day, if it emerges that the will of God is that I suffer the humiliation and even and physical suffering of imprisonment, nothing is more important to Ignatius than that his life be totally aligned as best he can discern to the will of God day by day. That is what Ignatius is about. You remember in the principle and foundation of the exercises, Ignatius says, the human person is created to love and to reverence and to serve God. But remember that service of God for Ignatius is not something which is almost like penal or, or uh, demeaning. Um, for Ignatius, how is it that people come to, to want to serve God? I'm flipping to the very end of the spiritual exercises where Ignatius asks people to pray for an internal knowledge of all the good that I have received from God. The end of the spiritual exercises, this whole process, this whole Ignatian pedagogy is to lead people to the point where they, receive, they pray and pray God, receive from God an internal knowledge, not a theoretical knowledge, that is, that's there, but a profound internal knowledge of all the good that I have received. And then being moved by gratitude, I turn myself over entirely uh, in love and in service of the divine majesty in all things. So for Ignatius, service is gratitude put into action. That's important. So service is not something, you know, servile. <laughs> it's not something that, you know, you have to do to please God and stay in God's good graces. We serve God not out, not out of obligation, but out of the gift uh, of acknowledging and experiencing deep inside of us uh, the extraordinary graciousness and love of God that's come to us uh, in ways that uh, are infinite. And for Ignatius, that knowledge, that internal knowledge is what transforms everything. The internal knowledge of all that God has given to me in creation, in, in, in Jesus, in my own particular history, in the beauty of the world, uh, in my daily life. This experience of gratitude is what explodes. This, this inner knowledge explodes. It develops into, into gratitude, which must incarnate itself in, in, in loving service, in loving service. So for Ignatius to serve God uh, is not an obligation. If <laughs> It's an obligation of love. It's what love generates. Um, so, all right. So Ignatius is saying, look, if, if being in prison is what God wants, it's fine by me. It's fine by me, because I want nothing more than to serve the divine majesty and to be utterly aligned with Jesus in serving the will of the Father uh, through service of God's people. 
And so for Ignatius, you know, you know, with Jesus in mind as model, here we are just after the Paschal Triduum, uh, we follow Jesus through his passion and his death. So Ignatius will say, nothing would delight me more than the opportunity to be so conformed with Christ, uh, even in his sufferings and in his, uh, and in his, uh, in his rejection, that, that I will follow him no matter what. But let's go back just for a second to, because uh, as I say, it, it certainly, Don, Don, and Don, you were reminding this of, of this, you know, throughout, whether Ignatius is in Salamanca or even in Paris or in Rome, opposition, hostility, um, rumors, uh, negativity keep coming. Um, even in our own time and in, in, your, in your own historical memory, what are the things that people find about the Ignatian tradition or the Jesuit tradition, uh, which makes them think that um, what causes people to hate or, or, or oppose or challenge uh, things Jesuit or Ignatian? And I don't mean this is so this is really not political. It's, it's like, what is there really? Some, there's something about the way we be that uh, that antagonizes or challenges or raises possible misunderstandings. So what is it about Ignatius in his time and in the Jesuit or Ignatian charism that is always going to rankle people or raise questions? Barbara? Now, by the way, I want to just preface this by saying not the Jesuits haven't given plenty of reasons to dislike us. You know, we can be arrogant, we can be unpleasant, we can be self-centered. You know, I'm, I can give you, I can give you the long list. But <laughs> apart from that, Barbara, no, I was thinking um, the inner freedom. Uh, go ahead. The inner freedom to not be bound by every single rule. Um, I think is a real threat to people and it's, um, it's Christ had it. And um, I think a lot of Jesuits do too. And I think that um, creates a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of people can get their hackles up self-righteously because they follow the rules and you don't necessarily. So I think that's part of it. I think you're right. I, I, I think I hear what you're saying, Barbara. Say more, could you say more about how this inner freedom is so central to Ignatius and his tradition? Probably not. <laughs> um, just that um, you're, the, uh, Ignatius, Ignatius, to my mind, was, the, was respectful of the rules of the day but wasn't, didn't allow himself to be pushed into um, categories that were not necessarily of God. And so I think that, um, for instance, I don't know, for, for the Jesuits in general, um, I don't know, I, I think I'm out of my league. So I'll let you take it from there. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank, I don't think you are, Barbara, but thank you. I'm not going to pressure you. Anybody else want to add to that? We do have a couple of hands raised, Vincenza and then Michael. Call them. Okay. Um, I would agree with, with Barbara. Vincenza, what she said in welcome. Terms of... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Him and all. Um, I was also going to say the constant for the truth and the constant willingness you know, to serve and not care about what people thought about you, which yeah. rubs a lot of people the wrong way. And then bringing his example into modern time, the, you know, going back to maybe Vatican II era and all of that, the Jesuits were known as the rabble rousers at that point, you know, and pushed, you know, people in various directions and also pushed the social norms as well and kind of kept the church moving forward sometimes. I always didn't agree, but that's right. what I saw. Right, right. Anybody else want to comment on that? Michael, if you want to chime in. I think you alluded to this a little bit farther, but I, I think that sometimes they are perceived as being a lot more liberal than maybe other yeah. orders. And so that sometimes like, I'm a Fairfield graduate and a Fairfield professor, proud of both. And I think it's great what they, they do, but I think that sometimes they're perceived as that. And so a little bit to the the ladies earlier part, rabble rousers, 
like there's a quote in the in the in the church in the chapel as you walk down the stairs there's something i think it's a rupee or something it's, it's like do you wonder why i'm i if i wonder why the people are poor they um think i'm a saint and if i try to help them they think i'm a communist so i think oh, they sometimes, the other way around <laughs> if i help people i'm a saint if i ask why they're poor then i'm a communist that's it. okay but and i think it's unfair i think the jesuits get a bad rap about that but i think that's why maybe in modern times i can't say for ignatius where they more more liberal thinking faith and reason uh i think that sometimes that comes across but i don't know what you think well I, you know i'm just raising the question i think i think you know even though she pulled back barbara i think you're right barbara it's there is something about the gift of ignatian spirituality which is about internal freedom which doesn't mean i'm not a, I, that i don't love and, and and i'm loyal to the church but that uh but that god is bigger than the church how about that but that mm -hmm. God, you know, of course, the Lord uses the church. The church is, we would say that the church is an instrument of God's salvation and redemption to us, but not uniquely and not solely. So that God is still perfectly capable of dealing with individuals and inspiring them. And that God is perfectly capable of speaking through, uh, you know, people of other religious traditions even. Uh, and, that, uh, and that salvation uh, of God is not limited to what happens inside of a church, but that, but that God is to be served and found and interacted with at the end of the exercises in all places and in all things. So there's, there's a breadth uh, which makes some people suspicious, and they're right. Jesuits can get lost because we're stretched. Ignatian people can get lost because we really do believe that God is everywhere in the world and that God is speaking through all people and through all traditions and in all circumstances, always giving priority and centrality to Christ. Uh, but there is, therefore, for us a healthy tension. Uh, and that makes some people very uncomfortable, uh, very, very uncomfortable. Um, all right. Kevin, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, I think the one thing that I always impress, impress me at, about the Jesuits is that it's not just a cerebral thing or a conviction thing. It's an action-oriented approach, right. right? There are results to be, ha to be driven, and, and the Jesuits were, tried to do that. And so that, you know, once you start to ruffle the feathers in reality, it becomes a little bit more obvious that there's, uh, there's something to react to. And some will react positive, some will react negatively. But it's important that you take it all the way through to the action, I think. You know, somehow, right, Kevin, and I think that that is reflected in that Ignatian paradigm of, of, of Ignatian uh, style ministry. We study the doctrine, we teach the doctrine, we have an interior discipline and we make the spiritual exercises and we organize people to respond to the poor. You know, that's always the paradigm. That last one is not optional. Uh, whatever Ignatius's most crucial experience was, it resonates with the experience of the early Christians where God is love. And, you know, and how do you show your love? By how you take care of the least of your brethren. And so I'm not saying other religious traditions don't do this. Certainly not. Uh, but there's an insistence that it be done also with learning and with discretion. Um, you know, what, what you were quoting, Kevin, not only do you ask, how do we take care of the poor, but eventually with solid learning, and that's something that Ignatius is going to come back to again and again. Uh, you know, knowing that we don't have all the time in the world and that I waste all my time in the beginning, I squander my time in the beginning. When Ignatius gets to Paris, he goes back to, remember, when he gets back to Paris, he says, damn, everything that I did in Barcelona, in Alcala, in Salamanca, it was never really organized. It was never really progressive. And so uh, he learned that in Paris, they had a method that was much more organized, much more coherent, and what was called the modus parensiensis. And Ignatius took that into all early Jesuit schools and into our tradition now. So if Fairfield or, Fair, you know, or Fordham or Holy Cross or Boston College had a core curriculum, it goes all the way back to Ignatius saying, look, there's something progressive, something that has to be coherent. Uh, learning has to go from step to step, has to be accountable, has to be, uh, has, to be, uh, um, uh, has to be proactive, has to be active learning. And so 
really uh, what Ignatius discovered at Paris is why we have a core curriculum and why we keep fighting and saying liberal arts is still important. And until we learn to read and write and analyze texts and put the numbers together, you can't go any further. And so although it can drive our undergraduates crazy, there's nothing that they praise more after they're out a few years and saying, thank God we had the core curriculum, right? Uh, thank God we had logic. Thank God we had enough. Now, I would say we've lost too much philosophy, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, but, that, but that a core curriculum, you know, fundamental core education in the liberal arts is essential. Ignatius saw that there was a pedagogy, a process of pedagogical uh, expression that was, that was vital. And he learned that. And so solid learning. And it would be typical of Jesuit uh, universities, but I would say it's typical of Ignatian ministries that goodwill, enthusiasm, zeal are not enough, that there must always be solid learning. And the discipline and the rigor that is involved with a willingness to do solid learning and to do hard studies. I was novice master and one, and, and I didn't have to make up what was supposed to happen in the novitiate. Thank God back in the 16th century, Ignatius already outlined it. There were things that I had to do. I had to make sure that all the candidates were willing to commit themselves to the rigors of solid learning. If they weren't, they might have a vocation to some religious order, but not ours. And this is not Ignatian, you know, arrogance, but it's if you want to help souls as somebody from the Ignatian tradition, you do it with solid learning and you subject yourself to the rigors and demands of solid learning. So I think that's also something that not everybody's comfortable with uh, in, you know, in an Ignatian way of proceeding. For example, so, you know, uh, we would say, that's why the, 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 the uh, Murphy Center for Ignatian Spirituality has a very, and from the time of Father Jim Bowler, we were determined that if people are gonna be spiritual directors, they're gonna have a very solid, there's gonna be very solid learning and supervision uh, and constant renovation of the person. So a typical Ignatian approach is, of course you trust God, but boy, you work like hell. And boy, you subject yourself to the rigors of constant analysis and supervision and acknowledgement that it's time to go back and learn again. Uh, and that's part of what our way of proceeding demands. Uh, and I think that that's also scary, scary for some people. Let me make sure, anyway, I want to make sure we don't leave, lose anything else now here. Um, oh, Ignatius on trial in Salamanca. What do you think about the way, he's, the way he's lured into his trial in Salamanca? I love my Dominican friends, but boy, this is a sad story. He's invited for dinner, for God's sake, and what happens? What happens when he's in Salamanca? Oh, come for dinner, Ignatius. The trap is set. Very important. The superior says, so is it true that you go about preaching like apostles? Aha, the trap is set. Yes, Gone. So how does Ignatius respond? He's, he's astute. Oh, you know, I, I don't have the exact words. But okay, well, do you remember how it, how it runs? Anybody well, remember how it runs? Because, look, if you're preaching, then logically enough, how did you, where, how, how much have you studied? So what are you preaching? Where's your license? What's, what's your background? Yeah. And so Ignatius says, look, I'm, 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 here, I'm here to tell you that I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the most educated of this whole bunch, and I have no solid formation. So, I mean, all of, all of, these, all of these incidents... Uh, confirm in Ignatius his determination that he's going to get a solid education. Boy, is he going to be sure that anybody who works with him is going to have a solid formation, right? Has to be solid. Mm -hmm. Not aristocratic, not yes, esoteric, not elitist, but solid, 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 solid. So, but what does he say when the Dominicans say, oh, so you're preaching, are you? Ignatius says, who said I was preaching? Who said I was preaching? The people who, who, you know, whom we give, give certificates from the Murphy Center, do you preach? 
No. Ignatius says, by the way, we do not preach. We speak to a few in a friendly manner about the things of God, just as one does after dinner. Don't you love it? Don't you love it? So the core, the core Ignatian and Jesuit spiritual mission is spiritual conversation, dinner talk. After a few glasses of wine and you talk about the things of God, you let people open their hearts. People are able to express their questions, their ch challenges, their sufferings, their, their, their anxieties, their desires, their aspirations. And Ignatius says, little by little, you sometimes talk about virtues, and you always praise them. And sometimes you talk about vices, and you condemn them. But always, always in the context of a conversation. That's not the way a lot of religious figures do their jobs. Mm. Is it? No. And I, I'm, not being, I'm not being petty or critical, but for Ignatius, the way that you work your way into and serve people is in the give and take of a conversation. That's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Imagine that a spirit, that a conversation is the place where God meets us, not by somebody who, because of a license or a collar, lays down the law and believes that he or she uh, has some sort of a privileged access to the truth, but that in the conversation, God is present, and God uh, will reach out. Go no, ahead, he was, yeah, well, he, he was I challenged. I see you chasing. They, Go they, ahead. They, they challenged him in a way because, too, they said, how can you talk about vice or virtue? Uh, where, where's your background? You should have some more, you should have some, some kind of degree or some type of authority, some type of coursework. And I think, to, to his credit, uh, Ignatius listened to that. And just like you were talking before about the core of liberal arts, that you, as a novice master, you, you have to get this body of knowledge that gives you, not necessary to put over on somebody, but kind of says, yeah, I, I've tried to acquire some information, some knowledge to apply it. And, and that's, that's was kind of interesting in that conversation uh, to me. You know, it was, it was a setup, but the point is he learned from that. Absolutely. His, his performance changed. He said, okay, I'm going to go get, get those degree, or I'm going to take the courses or whatever it is, and I'm going to come back and I'm still do God's work. But all, that's an important point. You remember, you know, they didn't fuss about vice and virtue. They said, all right, there's nothing you're saying, as far yeah. as we can tell, there's nothing that you're saying that, that you know, that uh, impedes your being able to have these spiritual conversations. But Ignatius is saying, look, what, what they said was, you cannot help people with any distinction between mortal and venial sin. Now, there are enough people of an age here where we understood why that was so crucial. Oh my God, was that a mortal or a venial sin? I don't think any of our students give a damn about whether something is a mortal or a venial sin, or if they know what a sin is. But, I mean, but for the people of Ignatius's time, uh, the scruples, we saw how he suffered with scruples. You know, am I, am I on the brink of hell because, because you know, of the finest. So Ignatius is saying, look, it's vital for people to be free, to have the understanding and freedom. Uh, and he was helping them do that. And so once they said, you can't do that, Ignatius said, the door has been closed. You're not allowing me to help people at the level they need to be helped. So I'll do the damn studies. He was already aware that he needed solid learning. And now he's going to do what the church is saying is your license to be able to address these sorts of problems. Mm -hmm. Why? Why? Because he wants honor and privilege. No. Mm. You know that, uh, that uh, because he knows how prone he is to be suckered in by the promise of honor. Remember, that's the very first line of the autobiography. I was seduced by my great and vain desire for honor. So he knows that he doesn't want to chase this for honor, but he's learned from experience that people need his presence they need what he can bring them through learning and from the exercises and you know what if, if he, he's not gonna he's not, not gonna jump ship uh ignatius is not gonna break communion with the church many do and many have and many continue to but ignatius remained wanting to live in the communion of the church and so he's dealing with the authority that's and what they're laying on him 
But why? Not because he wants power, not because he's drawn to clerical privilege. He despises all of that. Mm -hmm. He hates all that because he knows how dangerous it is for him, for, for everybody. He sees uh, how dangerous it's become, but for him, he knows how the attraction to privilege and honor and, and prestige, he knows how killing that is for himself. But nonetheless, he's willing to do it. Why? Because nothing is more important than to quotes unquotes, help souls, to help souls, to help souls, to help souls. And when he's helping souls, he's in total alignment with Christ, whom he believes calls him. Remember, Ignatius sees his life always and every human life as a call. In the, in the exercises, this is where Ignatius talks about the call of Christ the King, directed to each person individually and to all to share the life-giving message of what an authentic life looks like. So Ignatius, Ignatius says, all of us are sent. All of us are sent on mission. Life is a mission. Yeah, and our yeah, life yeah, mission. Yeah. Jerry, the one, the one thing I, I really admired about this story, that one little snippet, it says how a, a, a poor person or some Spaniard cheats him out of money. And then later on, he gets a, a note from that same Spanish person that said, I'm sick and I'm ill in Rouen. Will you come and give me some money? And very Christ-like, he goes there. He goes there. He goes there. He goes there. And that's me, you know, it, 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 the person, yeah, I said, I forgive you. I'll do all I can to help you. That's really Not only that, life. Ignatius looks at yeah. this guy and thinks there might be potential for him to be won over for Christ. Yeah, it's really he wonderful. doesn't write him off. He yeah. doesn't write him off. Yeah. When Ignatius, wait, I was going to, what was I going to tell you here? or ask you what you thought about. Um, I love it when Ignatius is in prison and his friends keep coming to take care of him. They keep coming to see him. So there he is. He's being he's put in prison, threatened by the Inquisition, and, quote, the pilgrim kept on his practice of speaking about the things of God. There's a stubbornness about Ignatius, which comes from this conviction that his life is a mission and that there's nothing more important than sharing with people the things of God. But he does it uh, from what we can tell. Well, we know the way Ignatius gave the exercises, how he told us to be giving the exercises. And he tells us, you know, I, didn't, I wasn't preaching at people. I wasn't wagging my finger at them. I was having conversations. Isn't that the way typically the best of our Ignatian tradition does its work with these conversations? Now, as we were saying earlier, and uh, Barbara, you were the one who picked this up, there's something very dangerous about introducing people uh, to the living spirit of Jesus. It gives them freedom and it makes them unpredictable. Um, some of you, there's a story, uh, you know, uh, Tess, I may have told this or Don when you guys were in formation, um, but one of our one of our uh, students who's no longer here, he did the ten week program where our students spend an hour every day uh, praying, reflecting, and then see a spiritual director once a week. This young gentleman came to see me, and uh, his father had pretty well decided. His father worked on the street. His father had pretty well decided that his son was going to uh, move into the family's finance business and that he was going to be uh, a tough-nosed financier. And um, the young man, when he was praying, discovered more and more uh, that his heart was not in that. And that what made him happiest, uh, he was an athlete, and what made him happiest was to help the younger athletes. Uh, and as much as he enjoyed, you know, having goals and being applauded, what made him much happier what made him himself was being uh, was helping to foster young people. Uh, he had never thought of himself in those in those in those terms, but as he was quiet, as he listened, as he w listened to the Jesus story, he said, "That's what I want to be about." 
And it was just before Easter uh, one year. And he said to me, well, Father, now don't mind if I use this language because I'm trying to be accurate. He said, now, Father, don't mind. He said, Father, my old man's going to be pissed at you. I said, why is that? He said, my old man's going to say that the, Je that the Jesuits got me soft in the head. Because the young man was going to have the courage to say to his father, I think I want to do something different. I think, I think maybe I want to be a high school teacher. That's not what you had in mind for me. You know, I think I'd like to be a high school teacher and a coach. Uh, and, the, and then and he said, my father's going to be, my father's going to be so pissed at you. And I said, Brendan, tell him, tell him to complain to God. I never told you you should be a high school teacher or a coach. But see, it's the freedom. Mm -hmm. So, Barbara, you're right. You know, Ignatius and this Ignatian tradition, once we, once we bring people to a place where they start listening and believing that God really is alive and speaks to them through their own experience and draws them to a place of, 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 uh, of authenticity uh, and in service, then... Um, then we're very unpredictable. And then, you know, in certain, certain kinds of people who don't want that and would regard our sort of the spirituality of empowering people to receive the freedom of the sons and daughters of God. That's pretty damn dangerous. Mm -hmm. All right, we're almost finished. My goodness, how did the time pass so quickly this week? It's good. All right, last opportunity for questions, comments, protests, corrections. Nobody? I'm not seeing any hands or anything. All right. Thank you all very much. So we will Thank go. You. We will go. I will pick up where, where we left. We didn't talk about what happened with Ignatius and companions at the very end in Paris, where at the, uh, at the chapel, uh, there's a little chapel on the base of Montmartre. Um, and it's uh, the chapel of, of Saint Denis. And Ignatius and his college roommates and companions made a promise that they didn't know where God was taking them, uh, but that they were going to stick this out together and that God was, that they were all pilgrims and that they were going to go to Jerusalem uh, and serve people there, maybe try to, to convert the Muslims. But in any case, uh, if they couldn't get to the Holy Land, that then they would go to the Holy Father and say, we're at your disposal. What, whatever you want us to do, we'll do. Uh, and that launches us into the, uh, the beginnings of the foundation of the Society of Jesus. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. We'll Thank see you for our good. final session uh, two weeks from tonight. It will be in May already, Tuesday, May 3rd. And we'll uh, cover the remainder of the book, chapters 9 through 11. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you all Jason. so much. Good night. Bye.